China's WS engines has just done something no one in the West thought they'd do at all. After decades of chasing GE's lead, China finally reached a point where even GE had to admit the progress is real. For the first time in 30 years, the engine race shifted, and the hit landed right on GE. But here's the part that keeps people talking. How did a program that once struggled to stay alive end up shaking a company that built its name on engines with almost flawless reliability? And what changed inside China's WS family that made GE step back and say the words no one expected? This is where the story begins, decades ago. To understand why GE felt that hit in 2025, you have to see how uneven the fight looked at the start. For years, China could build A-frames, radars, and missiles, but the engines holding it all together kept falling short. Western analysts even called engines China's final missing link. And they were not wrong. While GE and CFM were powering the world with engines that stayed on wing for tens of thousands of hours, China was stuck with machines that sometimes failed after only a few dozen. Every time a new fighter rolled out of a hangar, it still needed help from Russia or the West to fly at full strength. Inside China, this problem became more than a technical gap. It turned into a national pressure point. Leaders wanted the country to rise in the sky on its own engines, not borrowed ones. But the early WS program was rough. The WS-10, the engine meant to close the gap, ran into issues that made the whole effort look hopeless. Reports of short lifespans, surges and sudden failures spread across the defense world. On one side, you had GE, with experience built over decades. On the other side, a country trying to force a breakthrough with tools, alloys and skills that were still developing. That tension is what shaped the next 30 years. It set the stage for the clash between a company that ruled the engine world and a state program that refused to stay behind forever. And that clash only grew sharper from here. The pressure on China's engine program did not come from one setback. It came from a long chain of events that showed how far behind they really were. Through the 1990s and 2000s, China tried to build engines that could replace Russian power plants. The WS-10 was the main hope, but early results were rough. Some units lasted around 30 hours before needing work, a tiny fraction of the roughly 400 hours offered by the Russian AL-31. Engineers faced trouble with turbine blades, heat control, and even basic quality checks. At the same time, G and CFM were setting records. Their CFM-56 engines powered fleets across the world with shutdown rates so low they became the gold standard for reliability. China saw the numbers. The gap was massive. By the early 2010s, China knew this problem would not solve itself. In 2016, the government merged most of the country's engine firms into one new giant, the Aero Engine Corporation of China. It came with around 96,000 employees and billions in capital. The goal was clear. This was no longer just research. This was a national push to match companies like GE, Rolls-Royce, and Pratt. The real shift began when China finally started producing engines that worked well enough to stay in service, fly hard and return with fewer problems. It did not happen overnight. It took years of small gains, failed tests, and quiet upgrades. But by the early 2020s, something clear started to appear. The WS family was no longer stuck in the past. The WS-10 was once treated as a warning sign of how far China had to go. But around 2020, the story began to change. New J-10C fighters entered service powered only by WS-10 engines. Soon the same engine appeared on J-11B, J-15, and J-16 fighters, and even some early batches of the J-20. Later versions reached lifespans in the hundreds and then well over a thousand hours. It was not at G's level, but it cleared the line needed for active combat fleets. This was the first real sign that China could escape that early failure cycle. Then came the one that caught the world's attention, the WS-15. This engine was built to give the J-20 the thrust and speed it had been missing. Reports showed a test stand incident in earlier years, and delays followed. But by 2023 and 2024, something different appeared. New J-20A prototypes were flying with twin WS-15 engines. Sources called it a move towards serial production. The message was simple. China had a homegrown power plant for its top fighter. At the same time, the Y-20 transport fleet began flying with WS-20 engines. These large turbofans replaced the old Russian D-30s that China had relied on for heavy lift. It was more than a technical upgrade. It ended a long dependence that had followed China through every major transport project. Another step came with a WS-19, aimed at powering the J-35 carrier fighter. This put China in direct competition with engines in the same class as the GE F-414. The message was clear. 
China did not want to compete in one engine category. It wanted to compete in all of them. By this point, the world could see it. The WS family was no longer a weak spot. It was shaping China's future fighters, stealth jets and transports. And the impact of that progress was about to hit GE harder than anyone expected. The moment everything hit GE came in 2025. It did not happen in a lab or a hangar. It happened through policy, supply chains, and a public statement that caught the engine world off guard. In May 2025, the United States suspended export licenses for two key GE engines used by Comic, the Leap 1C and the CF-34. These engines were vital for China's C919 and C909 programs. Once that suspension was in place, Comic faced delays, airlines grew nervous, and the pressure moved straight into GE's world. For years, GE had been able to sell engines to China with little trouble. That changed overnight. The engines became tools in a larger fight, and GE was placed right in the middle of it. Then, in July 2025, the United States lifted the suspension and allowed GE to ship the engines again. It sounded like good news, but it was not a clean win. It showed something deeper. Engine supply to China could now be switched on and off like a tap. GE had seen the future, and it looked unstable. Inside China, this moment only confirmed what leaders have been saying for years. If one decision from outside the country could shake their aviation plans, then building their own engines was no longer just a goal. It was a survival requirement. The real hit came a short time later. At an industry event, GE's Steve Russell said something no one expected from a company with this much history. He said Chinese military engines were catching up. Not equal, not ahead, but no longer far behind. For a company that built its name on some of the best engines ever made, those words landed with force. They showed that GE could feel China's WS progress in a way it never had before. At the same time, new images showed J-20A prototypes flying with WS-15 engines, Y-20 transports using WS-20s, and J-10C fighters powered by WS-10s in steady numbers. The proof was in the sky. China was now flying what it built. That was the moment the decades-long balance shifted. Not because China matched GE on every metric, but because China no longer needed GE to move forward. And from here, the stakes only grew. The reason this shift matters becomes clear once you look at how much power jet engines hold over a country's place in the world. They are not just parts on a fighter or transport. They control how far a country can reach, how fast it can respond, and how long it can stay in the air. For years, China had the A-frames, the avionics, and the radar systems, but the engines kept it tied to other nations. With WS engines now powering key fighters and the Y-20 transport, China no longer has to depend on Russia for thrust or weight for parts from outside its borders. This is not a small shift. It changes how China can plan for the next decade. A country that once had to balance every move around foreign engine deliveries now sets its own pace. In many years, GE held an edge that felt safe. Even when China made progress on aircraft design, GE engines were still the benchmark. That gave GE influence, steady orders, and a deep presence in China's commercial market. But when the WS family proved it could handle real missions, that safety began to fade. It does not mean China can replace GE in the global market yet, but the long-term picture is no longer the same. China can now field fighters and transports with engines built at home. That means testing, upgrades, and new variants do not have to wait for foreign approval. Military planners can move faster, change designs quicker, and make decisions without checking outside supply lines. This kind of freedom shapes everything from patrol routes to long-range missions. China still depends on foreign engines for its airliners, especially the C919. But the progress of the WS and the rise of the CJ programs show where China wants to go. The country does not want a future where a single export license can slow down its entire aviation fleet. The more the WS family succeeds, the stronger China's push becomes to build commercial engines that can stand on their own. This is why the moment hit GE so hard. The company has been a leader for generations. But for the first time, it is facing a rival that does not want to buy its engines forever. China wants to build engines for its military, its airliners, and for other nations that do not mind taking a different path from the West. That ambition reshapes the global engine map. The impact of that ambition is probably only going to grow from here. The rise of the WS engines looks smooth from a distance, but the path behind it is filled with problems that shape the program just as much as the successes. These parts are rarely shown in state media, yet they explain why the world doubted China for so long. The first WS-10 units were not just weak. They were dangerous. 
Many reports from the 2000s showed engines failing after short flights, losing power, or suffering sudden surges. Some batches were rejected by the Air Force. This meant to train pilots or carry out missions had to wait, and aircrafts had to stay on the ground because the engines were simply not ready. This raised real safety concerns and slowed China's fighter plans for years. Poor reliability did not only affect machines, it affected the people around them. When an engine fails during training, it means more risk for pilots and more hours on maintenance crews. A single weak component can ground entire squadrons. While these issues rarely became public, they shape how the military viewed the WS program in its early years. The rivalry did not stay technical. It moved into courtrooms and headlines. U.S. cases linked stolen GE turbine files to groups inside China. The turbine panda campaign targeted suppliers tied to the C919's engine systems. These events damaged trust between the two countries and added another layer of tension. For China, it showed how far they still had to go. For the U.S., it showed how far China was willing to push. The 2025 export suspension showed how fragile the commercial engine relationship had become. Airlines in China faced delays. Comac had to slow production. GE risked missing targets and losing future confidence. And when the suspension was lifted weeks later, it only proved the point. One move in Washington could shake the entire supply chain. All these setbacks could have broken a smaller project. Instead, they fueled the push behind AECC. Every failed WS-10, every stalled test, and every export shock pushed China further toward independence. The controversies did not slow the story. They shaped it. And they set the stage for the moment when China finally took a step GE could no longer ignore. From here, the story reaches its peak. This is where the long climb pays off. After decades of failures, retries, and quiet upgrades, China finally reached a point where the sky looked different. Fighters that once needed Russian engines were now flying with WS power. Transports that depended on old designs were taking off with engines built at home. And the J-20, China's top stealth fighter, was now testing with the WS-15, the engine they had waited for since the start. For the first time, China was not following. It was moving on its own path. Then came the moment that confirmed it. GE, the company that had set the standard for years, said China's engines were catching up. Not someday, not in theory. Right now, that single line showed the whole world that the race had changed. China did not match every metric. Not yet, but it no longer needed outside engines to keep its air force moving. And that change sent a message across the aerospace world. A message that could not be taken back. The balance is about to shift. The rise of the WS engines does still not mean China passed GE. GE still leads in fuel burn, durability, and long-term reliability. But that is not the part shaking the industry. The real shock is that China no longer needs foreign engines to fly its most important military aircraft. That kind of freedom changes how a country plans for conflict, competition, and the next phase of its aviation growth. From here, GE faces a new kind of rival. One that is not trying to buy engines, but trying to build its own future. One that can test, refine, and upgrade without waiting for any outside help. And one that is willing to invest for years without worrying about profits or shareholders. This is why the shift matters. Not because China closed every gap, but because it closed the one weakness that held it back the longest. For the first time, both sides are entering a phase where the old rules do not apply. And the next steps will decide far more than who builds the best engine. China's WS engines changed the balance in the sky, but this story is not finished. The next phase is already taking shape in China's factories. The CJ programs are moving forward, and each step brings them closer to engines that could one day power their airliners without any help from the West. And here's the part no one can answer yet. What happens if China reaches that goal faster than expected? What happens to GE when the last piece of leverage is gone? That question will shape the next stage of this rivalry.